Good afternoon. On behalf of the Networking and Information Technology Research and Development Program, including the FASTER Community Practice, uh, I'm Bob Chaddock from the National Science Foundation. It's my privilege to welcome you all to our, uh, our presentation this afternoon. Uh, I'm also pinch hitting uh, from my colleague, Dr. Robert Bond. Um, Bob, are you out there? No, he, I, I think he is, but uh, we will, they, they, you may be muted, but at some point uh, I'd welcome you also, Bob, your own reflections. Um, in all of the aspects of networking and information technology, one of the things that I value the most is basically is the contributions to expand the participation of all of us in computing. And in particular, the, the interest that we have today is really is the aspects of providing for the services and the capabilities for, um, for people with disabilities. So in that respect, what I, I have the privilege of introducing uh, Dr. Clayton Lewis, a professor of computer science and fellow of the Institute of uh, Cognitive Science at the University of Colorado Boulder, where he'll provide an overview of updates and his developments involving the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure Initiative. So with that, uh, Dr. Lewis, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the NSF and also to the NIDU program, so thank you. Thank you, Bob, for that introduction. That's a, a good lead-in, indeed, to what I hope to talk with all of you about. So uh, welcome, everybody out there in phone land. And, uh, those of you that are here, even if you're sitting so far back that I can hardly see you, I'm glad that you're, I'm glad that you're here. So, uh, as was mentioned in the introduction, in, in real life, as I think of it, I am a, a computer science professor, but uh, this year I've, uh, I'm having the pleasure of uh, serving as consultant to the National Institute on Disability and Rehabilitation Research. NIDER is a modestly scaled research agency down in the, uh, the very large Department of, of Education. It's there kind of for historical reasons, but NIDER has been active in funding work for many years in the development of technology to do the things that Bob was talking about, of really making sure that the technology we develop uh, provides opportunities for people with disabilities, and that's a big theme in what I'll be uh, talking with you about uh, today. So if we, if we step back a little bit, we can see that uh, one of the great benefits of what we can call computational technology is that it offers greatly improved uh, access uh, to all kinds of things for people with disabilities. And that's really because of the flexibility and configurability of what we can call computational representations are sometimes called machine-readable uh, representations. So it's in the nature of these representations that they can be very flexibly transformed. And I'm, I'm not going to take you through a long list, but one will serve, I think, and you're all aware of other potential like this. So text-to-speech is something that's now a readily available, inexpensive, and, and quite effective technology that allows you to take a textual material and have it uh, transformed into an audio form. So if we think of somebody who's blind, until fairly recently, a simple act like reading the news meant reading the newspaper, and you couldn't do it, really. Uh, but now, with newspapers being published online, it's, it's perfectly straightforward to convert that printed visual, what would have been a printed visual form, into a form in which people can, uh, can uh, hear it. As I say, this is a, a point that can be generalized to lots and lots of transformations of information into, into different forms. So in theory, computational representations have this wonderful and extremely useful flexibility, but in practice, it's not always uh, so easy. So the, the challenges we're going to be talking about today is what can we do to shape the technology in such a way that it's going to be easier for people to take advantage of this flexibility and get access to the content and services that they need. And at the same time, uh, how can we shape the technology to make it easier for the people who create content and services to do that in a way that makes them accessible to the widest range of possible users of that, uh, of that information? And as was mentioned, uh, I want to focus on an international initiative called the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure Initiative, 
I'm proud to say on behalf of NIDR that the development of this uh, vision, as, as I'll be explaining it to you, has been funded uh, uh, by, for some years by NIDR, uh, largely through the efforts of uh, Professor Greg Vanderheiden of the University of Wisconsin. Some of you might know uh, Greg. So Greg, while many, many people are involved around the world in developing this vision that we'll be talking about for a bit, uh, Greg certainly uh, deserves the credit as being the kind of spearhead uh, for this. So to give you a quick idea about this vision, I'm going to use a video that actually Jim Tobias, one of the people on the call, as I understand it, was one of the uh, key figures behind. And I'm just going to play a part of this, if I can get to the desktop here. But that might do, I guess. No, it doesn't. I guess I've got to actually go all the way to there. And then there we go. All right. So let's see how easy and flexible this technology is. We all is. use technology yeah, good. every day. Okay. A person at a library computer, a person using a mobile phone, a person buying a train ticket. And we're using it to do more things all the time. Library card catalog becomes a computer. Some of the things we used to do face-to-face, -face, we now do with automated systems. Ticket booth becomes a ticket machine. For most of us, those systems are okay most of the time. And when there are problems, we can find a way to get along. Clear on ticket machine screen. Hand shields the screen so it can be read. But those of us with disabilities often run into situations where the technology doesn't work well enough to meet our abilities. Person with low vision sees a blurry ticket machine screen. In some cases, we can use assistive technology to bridge the gap. Assistive technology, or AT, can provide text for speech. Video chat with captions. Turn text into speech. The weather today will be mostly sunny. Or make words on a screen easier to read. Computer login screen in high contrast. Whatever the user needs to accomplish a task. Unfortunately, we don't all have the assistive technology we need, and we can't always take it with us to use anywhere we want. Imagine if you could pick up any device anywhere, and it would automatically adapt to you. Person picks up device and it changes size. Imagine. Someone who is usually confused by technology. Now every computer looks like their personal device. Simple, with just the controls and features they need. Complicated computer screen changes to a simple version. Imagine a student who has to use computers in different labs and classrooms. If all of them worked exactly as needed. Student in two classrooms, each computer becomes accessible if she needs it. There is a way to offer accessibility solutions to more people in more situations. We call it the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure, or GPII. The GPII will use the cloud, the electronic networks that power most of our information services, and the intelligence and electronic products themselves. Cloud with server symbols and dotted lines show information flow. Right now, we use the cloud to store information, transmit it to the right destination, and convert it from one form into another. Information moves into, around, and back out of a cloud to various devices. The GPII will take the same cloud idea and use it to support accessibility. Users will start with a wizard that helps them choose how they want their personalized interface to look and work. Person at computer making selections and store that profile in the cloud so that it's available from then on. Profile information flows into the cloud. Accessibility developers will create tools for the toolbox that address those needs. Accessibility software flows into the cloud. The GPII will store information about devices, their uses and features. Device information flows into the cloud. Then, when a user needs an accessibility feature, The GPII will take the right user profile and features, check the device, and guide the device in using its own features to meet the user's needs. Accessibility information flows from the cloud to the phone, screen changes to large print. The GPII will automatically apply the right tool to whatever device the person is using wherever it is. 
so the interface will work the right way. The same person now sees large print on a train ticket machine. The GPII will be great for users. It will support independence with enabling technology. When you need it, where you need it, how you need it. There's no need to explain, negotiate, or justify anything. It just works. All of the information will be kept private and secure. A traveler gets the right interface at airport, check-in, information kiosk, and the seat back display on the plane. The GPII will be great for society. It will offer wider participation in education, employment, commerce, and our communities. Many people on a street with a school, offices, stores, and community center. The GPII will provide developers with the tools and parts they need to develop AT more easily and at lower cost. Developers can then upload their products to the GPII marketplace, quickly making them available globally. Developer creates new AT, uploads it to the cloud, and people around the world access it. The GPII will give mainstream technology companies an easy way to match accessibility features to their products and services as they're being designed. Product designers upload its features to the cloud. Where professional services are needed, the GPII will give counselors, therapists, and educators more options for evaluation and management. Client and therapist work together on the wizard. The GPII will let schools, libraries, and other public locations serve everyone more easily. Every user will get the interface they're already familiar with. The weather today will be mostly sunny. Library computer shows low vision interface, then screen read interface for two different users. Employers will be able to accommodate new employees. They can promote and relocate employees without having to reconfigure or reinstall a lot of technology. Employee gets promoted, new workstation automatically has the accessible interface. The GPII will offer a new way of providing accessibility when, where, and how it's needed. Oh, this thing is too smart. I was just positioning the cursor and it uh, it clicked. Anyway, let's let's just finish it off. We're here. just getting started building it. GPII construction site. We'll be working closely with consumer advocates, AT and mainstream technology companies, and other stakeholders to make sure it meets their needs. The GPII needs the help of policymakers and leaders. Capital building with policy leaders. We hope that you find the GPII as exciting as we do. So thanks, Jim, for that uh, for that introduction. So as you can see, that's an ambitious and inclusive agenda. And it's one that uh, that actually is coming true. As I'll be giving the, the uh, development status of it in a few minutes. But before doing that, I want to zero in on one of the scenarios and look at it a little more carefully to set up for some of the stuff that we're working on. And uh, as you saw in the video, the, uh, the the vision is comprehensive from seatback computers to more conventional kinds of workstations. Out of that big world, I want to focus on one strategic part of it, which is access to the web. So this is a, a scenario showing the role of the, uh, the, uh, the cloud there. So a user has uh, specified their preferences, how they want information to be presented to them. And this could be the, ideally the widest range of possible choices. Some people benefit from unusual color contrast, for example. Other people don't even know what color contrast is. So what it is, in case you're in that category, is uh, for some people, black on white or white on black text is harder to read than, let's say, purple on yellow. And so if you're one of those people, you could specify in your preferences, I want purple on yellow when text is displayed to me. 
I need a bigger font than is usual, so in my specification, I'd specify what my preferred uh, font size is. Whatever my preferences are, I specify those. Those are kept available online. Now, I authenticate with a modified browser, and I'll say more about that in a minute, and those preferences are automatically accessed, and any content that I, or service that I access on the web the interface is automatically rendered in a way that respects my preferences. A word about the, the modified browser there. The point of this is not that a person with a disability needs to use some special browser. The hope is that real soon now, everybody's browser will work this way. And actually, both Microsoft and the Mozilla Foundation are involved in this project with the expectation that both Firefox and IE will actually behave in this way. And then the thought is that all browser vendors will see it in their interest to actually support this, uh, this scenario. So that's the deal. You specify how you want things to be presented to you and how you want to interact with them, and those preferences, once expressed, are automatically applied without your having to fool around, fiddle around, and hope to be able to adjust things uh, when you need to move into a new setting. Here's the status of it. So. Uh, uh, year and a half ago, roughly, the European Commission uh, started uh, funding of about an $11 million implementation project called uh, Cloud for All. The Government of Canada is also supporting uh, some participation there, and I'll be saying more about that later. It's looking now as if the Commission will be putting additional funds uh, into this. Uh, there were hopes that uh, the U.S. would be making uh, actually a somewhat bigger commitment to this, but with all of our budget problems, that has not actually come through. Uh, nevertheless, the leadership at NIDER has determined that this is strategic, and so they've carved some funds out from uh, the existing agency budget uh, to support this, and I'll be telling you a little bit more about the cloud initiative. That's indeed how come I happen to be at NIDER, is to help get that initiative uh, going. Another uh, piece of fairly recent news, some of you I presume now about NSTIC, uh, the National Strategy for Inclusive Identities in Cyberspace. A part of that program is a family of pilot projects exploring new technologies for online authentication. And uh, one of those pilot projects is actually going to be using the management of these accessibility attributes as one of its demonstration domains, which we're very ex excited about. Uh, there are demos working of the, the core of this, and uh, if, if some of you are interested, if you drop me a note, I can try to uh, point you to the, uh, uh, the latest and greatest uh, there. So this, is, this, uh, this ambitious vision is starting to become, uh, starting to become uh, real. As was mentioned in the, uh, in the video, while the point of this really in the end is what it does for what we could call end users, uh, people who are consuming information are using uh, services, uh, those that the content they're going to access and the services they're going to use have to be created by people. And so it's, it's also important that this work actually makes it easier for people to actually uh, create that uh, stuff. So uh, as was mentioned in the video, there are efforts to make it easier for people to uh, uh, distribute accessible content, make it easier for uh, consumers to actually locate them. But I want to focus for some of the uh, next part of the presentation here on uh, the development of accessible applications and how the technology is emerging to actually uh, support that. And the key to this is the theme that I sounded right at the outset of the talk, which is uh, we need to uh, take advantage of the flexibility of computational representations to actually make this happen. And uh, any of you that are in the software world knows that uh, software participates in a kind of a paradox. So on the one hand, you can, you can get software to do anything. It's extremely plastic and flexible in that way. But at the same time, we know that once you've created software to do something, it's extremely difficult to change it and get it to do something else. And to do the work we're talking about here, that's a paradox that has to be cracked. So we have to find ways to actually create software that's much more readily configurable than software typically is today. That's going to be the theme of a good deal of the rest of our uh, discussion here. The work on this is being done uh, 
by a distributed group of projects based at OCAD University in Toronto. Some of you may know Yuta Trevoranos is pictured up there. Yuta was for many years at the University of Toronto, but a couple of years ago now moved across town to establish a new program in inclusive design at Ontario College of Art and Design University, or OCAD University, which was itself escalated from uh, College of Art status to university status a number of years ago by, in the Canadian educational system. Uh, Yuta, like Greg, is uh, a, a very inspiring and capable leader and has a real gift for putting together international distributed projects and, and really attracting uh, terrific people to work on that stuff. And uh, uh, what I'm going to describe here is certainly an illustration of, of that. So the overall aim of this fluid family of projects that's now working in tandem with the European Cloud for All uh, project is to make it easier for people to uh, develop these accessible applications and in particular to support this, this key attribute of configurability that's our focus here. The lead architects are the, the uh, people you see here, Antronig Bosman, who actually at the moment is based in, uh, in, in Boulder, and Colin Clark, who's at, uh, at OCAD. And what I'm going to be taking you through here uh, is something about work that Antronig and Colin are doing in creating extension to something called the inversion of control paradigm for software configurability. And here I need to uh, invite uh, those of you who are not uh, software engineers, computer scientists, or other forms of nerds and geeks, feel free to let your eyes glaze over during uh, the next part of the, of the presentation, but I'll try to keep it, keep it fairly, uh, fairly brisk. So as I've, as I've said, uh, software is, is really hard to uh, modify, and so Today, the way configurability is handled is that people try to pre-plan all the ways in which a piece of software might need to be modified in response to conditions. Well, that's okay as far as it goes, but that's not really very far. And the reason is that new configurability demands emerge all the time. So it's literally not possible to plan all the ways that software needs to be configurable. And a perfectly good example from the web world is the fairly recent development of HTML5. So up until that existed, nobody knew that they would want to do the things that HTML5 allows you to do. So what you really need is a way to allow uh, software to be modified to take advantage not just of the possibilities you knew about at the time you wrote the software, but possibilities you didn't know about at the time you wrote the software, which is uh, a trick. And with conventional software architecture, there's it's really no good answer to that solution. We need advances in software architecture to make this, this work. And the work that the Fluid folks are doing is enhancing this inversion of control paradigm to make it more flexible, but at the same time tackle some of the other issues in software configurability by moving as much of all of this as possible from the domain of code into the domain of declarative specifications. And that's what I'll be trying to illustrate uh, for you here. So the aim is to have software which in its operations depend, uh, uh, depends on, uh, as sensitively as possible on the context of use. We've seen one kind of context that we want software to be sensitive to and that's the context that's defined by user needs and preferences. But there are other ones that are also important to address, including platform features such as browser characteristics. So one of the examples that's uh, been developed by the, the Fluid Group, uh, I can illustrate briefly, I'll take you into a little more detail on uh, how user preferences would be uh, responded to. But let's suppose that you're writing a web application and at some point the user needs to upload a file. Well, there are a bunch of different ways that you might want to handle that file upload, but which one you can use depends on the characteristics of the browser the user happens to be sitting in front of. So uh, they might have a browser that's old and cranky and only supports plain old HTML, and so you're going to get a cranky old file upload box there. If they've got Flash, then you can give them something a little uh, whiz-banger, 
And if they have a modern browser that supports HTML5, then you can do better yet. So what you really want is for the person who develops the web application to simply say, I want file uploading here, and to have the software architecture actually select the best of the currently supported uh, uh, actual uploading components uh, for uh, the person to use. And the way this is going to be done, as you can see, is that you don't have to pre-plan what the range, the person developing the application doesn't have to pre-plan the range of choices. They just say, I want a file uploader. It's the job of a further specification to indicate what the range of possibilities actually is and how the particular choice is going to be made when the application is deployed in a particular setting. Why does it matter that this is going to be done with a declarative uh, specification? Well, it's because of the viscosity, one could say, of, of code. Code is really hard to change. It's full of kind of cross-dependencies. You change this part, you've got to remember to change that part over there. Declarative specifications can be much more loosely coupled. So uh, I'm going to spare you the demo here. Uh, but maybe even more boring is I'm going to show you some of the declarative specifications that underlie the, uh, the demo. But here's what the demo would show. So this is a Greek web page. Uh, so this is a sort of made up encyclopedia kind of information. And if you're a person who has a text disability, and there are a variety of reasons you might have that, both visual and cognitive, but if you're a person who has difficulty reading, you don't want to have to read all this stuff to figure out what's going on on the page. You'd like to be able to zero in just on the heading structure here. And so here is an outline presentation of that same page. So some people could put in their specification, when you're going to show me a complicated page, show me a heading view first. And if I find out from reading the headings that I want to actually read one of the subparagraphs, then I'll select that, that heading and I'll see what's there. But I don't want to have to have all that text on the screen and try to slog, slog through it. Some of you might be puzzled by this, and I'll just note that uh, we're not generally aware of it, but reading is not a monolithic skill. We think of it as one, but it's not. There's a real distinction between the ability to read running text and the ability to skim. And one of the things that can happen to people, for example, some aphasics, lose the ability to skim. They can still read. It's difficult for them to do that, too. But at least with a struggle, they can read text. But what they can't do, which any, any typical reader can do, is just look at a, 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 a page like this one and just immediately pick out the headings and look only at those. They lose the ability to do that. As a person with aphasia that I was working with, observing their use of the web, struggled to tell me because speaking was also difficult, Clayton, I have to read everything. So for them, getting a presentation in which they don't have to read quite as much of everything to get an orientation of what's going on the page is really valuable. So this is the contrast we're interested in. We'd like to make it as easy as possible for somebody to say, I just want that view. So how could they do that? And here's the part. Feel free to uh, 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 look away uh, during, during this part of it. So what's going to happen is, that the person developing the web page is going to put something onto the page that says this thing maybe is going to be a table of contents. And if that appears, then it's going to push the rest of the content of the page down below the fold, which is what you were, you were seeing there. But whether this thing expands to a table of contents or not is going to be controlled by declarative specifications. And here's what this stuff looks like. So that might look at first glance like code, but it actually isn't. So this is, some of you will recognize that this is JSON, JavaScript object notation. One of the nice features of the JavaScript language uh, is its uh, flexible way of describing uh, uh, objects in a, uh, in, a, in a textual form like this. And uh, so this is a bunch of, of, uh, of declarative specification, and I'll just take you quickly through how some of this stuff is, is done. So that thing down there that's called maybe TOC, that's the thing that the developer puts on the page that says this is going to be a table of contents, perhaps, depending on stuff to be specified later. Uh, the code up there is actually responsible for examining the context in which the page is being viewed, which would include that user specification of their preference. And based on finding that information, 
uh, a tag is going to be stuck into the context that's going to be visible when this page gets rendered in the browser. So there's a kind of an indirection here where uh, this code here is going to, uh, or this declarative specification is going to determine under what circumstances and what things would be said in the user's profile that would cause a tag saying either uh, yes table of contents or no table of contents to be stuck into the rendering context. These are what are called the demands blocks. So these specify the logic, and in this case it's extremely trivial, but this specifies the logic under which that thing that's going to sometimes be a table of contents and sometimes not, how it's determined how that's going to behave. So in particular, that top one there says, if you're interested in what to do with this maybe table of contents thing, if you find that particular yes TOC ta uh, uh, tag in the context, then expand the maybe TOC components as the table of contents component. The second uh, demand block uh, does the opposite. It says if you, if you find a different tag, then expand it differently. So long way around the barn on that, uh, but I'll, I'll uh, come back in a minute uh, to sort of explain my motive in actually getting to that level of technical uh, uh, detail here. But I'll mention a couple of other things for those of you that are into web technology. So uh, there are a million web frameworks out there, and the people working on the uh, Fluid framework are very well aware of some of the reasons why these frameworks don't get adopted very widely. Uh, and one of the key things is that people who develop stuff for the web are very concerned about controlling what things look like. So one of the things that Fluid has done is to diminish to the greatest extent possible the impact of what they are doing in their framework on what you can do in marking up your page. So obviously the appearance of your page is going to be changed by things like whether you have a table of contents there, but other things about the way the page looks are going to be left to the greatest extent possible up to you. And then there's some other uh, things there having to do with namespace management, other stuff that they're very careful about to try to uh, reduce the obstacles to adoption of a framework like this. So just pausing uh, for a moment here and reminding you of, of both the introduction of the talk and some of the points that were made in the video, what we're talking about here is really important. So again, coming up from the technical stuff, why do real people really care about this stuff? If you analyze what's happening in society, more and more of what we're doing is really happening in the online world. That means it's, it's critical that people with disabilities be allowed to participate in that world. And just to pick one example that we're very concerned about at the moment, consider the world of online education. This is something that can be, should be, one could say, a huge opportunity for people with disabilities because of the intrinsically greater potential for accessibility in that space. The challenge for all of us is to make sure that online educational technology develops in such a way that it in fact is accessible to people with disabilities. And the work we're talking about here is a major part of the investment to bring that about, to get it so that once I've indicated how information needs to be presented to me, then I can access whatever online educational content I want and have that content delivered to me in a form that works for me. And, and one could repeat that argument for many other facets of modern life. So I mentioned earlier that uh, NIDR is uh, continuing its investments in this area. As I said, the development of the vision for the Global Public Inclusive Infrastructure Initiative uh, that, that's been funded over several years by uh, NIDR. We also have partnerships, including a small one with NSF, which we would love to expand. So we are doing some joint funding with NSF. Uh, Robert Bond and I met because uh, we have a cooperative project with the NIST Cloud Computing Program uh, to uh, support accessibility and federal cloud deployments. We also have a second partnership with Sharon Laskowski and her group at uh, NIST. Uh, evaluating the technology we're talking about here as a way of making voting more accessible. Today, voting for people with disabilities is pretty much of a train wreck. And we're looking to see whether the technology we're talking about here can be used to really make it easier for uh, voting equipment to be set up in the way that it needs to to meet the needs of particular uh, people. 
we're also supporting at NIDR a contract with IBM and others on a particular sub-problem here, which is how does a person with disabilities actually set up the specification of how they want things to be presented to them? Some elements of that specification are pretty straightforward. So I mentioned that I need a little bit bigger font. It's not too hard for me to kind of look at fonts and say, yeah, this would be a good default font size for me. But many people are unaware that they can adjust things about how their keyboard operates. And for some people with motor issues, this can be quite important. So some of you may know that if you leave your finger on a key for a while, after some interval, it will begin to repeat. Well, if you're a person with certain kinds of motor challenges, that's going to happen when you don't want it to happen because you have trouble getting your finger off the key quickly enough. It's important for you to be able to set that repeat threshold to a more liberal value so that the key waits longer before starting to repeat. As I said, most people, many people probably don't know that that's something that they could do, uh, let alone what value for that threshold would work well for them. This is a case in which there's research that's been out there actually for several years showing that if you give someone a test passage to type and you record and analyze what happens when they type, you can make a good recommendations to them about these keyboard settings. So, we have a, a, a contract in process to review all that literature and propose an architecture for tools to be used to support people in creating these uh, specifications of needs and, and, and preferences. Uh, uh, we've got a, uh, a, 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 a hope for a research program. This, some of you will know the jargon here, others we, you will not. Uh, when NIDR issues an RFP, it has to go through several stages, which include uh, publishing a proposed priority, and uh, uh, we have one of those up there for inclusive cloud and web computing, if, if any of you know people interested in that. Uh, publishing these proposed priorities doesn't mean that we're actually going to be able to issue funding there, but it's an indication that we at least want to be in that, uh, that position. Okay, so why did I throw the nerd and geek stuff at you? One of the things we're recognizing at NIDR, and we're not alone in this, of course, you know, across our society, people are realizing that computer science is becoming central to all kinds of things that it didn't used to be central to. And one might even say, for people who wish it wasn't uh, central. But uh, nevertheless, when NIDR looks at its world, it's obvious that computing technology is in the middle of much of what we might hope to accomplish for people with disabilities. Having said that, NIDR's existing portfolio of grantees tends not to be oriented that way, with some notable exceptions, such as, as Greg Vanderheide. But we have a need to attract much more computer science talent, knowledge, and insight to our table if we're going to realize the potential of the work that we're, we're talking about here. So one of the reasons I was really happy to have a chance to give this talk is to get this word out there to uh, uh, those of you that might yourselves be recipients of this message, but I'm sure most, more of you are in a position really to kind of spread the word to, to others, to, to students, to, uh, uh, to academic uh, colleagues, wherever they might be. NIDR is very interested in capacity building in, uh, in computer science as applied to opportunities to serve people with disabilities. So talking about that high level theme of the cloud, the global public inclusive infrastructure is a big piece to bite off, but it doesn't exhaust the opportunities as some of you may already have been reflecting. So I wanted to mention briefly some additional opportunities that we see at uh, NIDR. And, and as you'll also see, I mean, the, 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 the cloud is a, is a background enabling technology that enables all kinds of things in, in ways where the nature of the cloud isn't, isn't so important. But the opportunities that the cloud creates to do things, especially cost effectively, that weren't possible before is, is really transformative in, in many areas, as I'm sure, I'm sure all of you know. But just to take one of the kind of sub-areas here, uh, actually, I'll tell you a, a little bit more about this. So 
consider the world of special education, so education for kids with disabilities. For, for many years, every kid in the special education system has uh, uh, an individual education plan that uh, uh, defines the services that they will be offered. Uh, until fairly recently, those plans sat in manila folders all over the country. And so even if you'd had the idea of making any use of the huge amount of data available there about what kinds of conditions kids have, about their longitudinal development, all kinds of things accumulates in those manila folders uh, in, a, in a way where it can never be used. Well now, uh, in, in common with many other kinds of data, data of this kind are now being captured and maintained online in the cloud. So it's not just that they are in databases, in uh, isolated databases, they're now increasingly being kept in databases which could be interconnected. There are many challenges associated with actually making use of these data, not least the privacy restrictions that are involved there, but the upside potential of being able to make appropriate use of, of data of, of this kind is, is really enormous, and not just in special education, but in really any area of what you could call disability services. So uh, uh, being able to uh, aggregate and appropriately analyze on a national scale data about services for children or adults with disabilities is, is a tremendous upside area. And I'll just make a point which may be obvious to you. Being able to aggregate at a national scale is more important in this area than it might be in some others because thankfully disabilities are widely scattered. So a particular school district, for example, isn't going to have very many kids with a particular kind of challenge that they're facing. And so to be able to understand how that challenge can be effectively met is extremely useful if you're in a position to, act, we, we, we feel, we hypothesize, extremely useful to be able to aggregate uh, such data on a national level to really see which interventions work, which interventions don't work uh, from data of that kind. Another data aspect of, of the world uh, kind of comes at it the other way around in a way, you could say. So, People with disabilities face an enormous paperwork burden. And nowadays, most of it isn't literally paper, but it's what you could call digital paper. How does that come about? Well, in our legal system, there is no concept of permanent disability. So if you're a person who is eligible for services as a person with disabilities, you have to reestablish eligibility often annually which means every year you're going through a process of presenting basically the same information you presented last year, but it's up to you to go through that process. Furthermore, the services that you are eligible for are often offered by a multiplicity of different agencies, and so you end up presenting more or less the same information many times to many different agencies. Well, the, the real solution you'd hope for to this would be some level of bureaucratic coordination that would allow appropriate sharing of data so people wouldn't have to do this. But that's more than a technical challenge. Something that we feel is more within reach is developing technology that will allow people more effectively to manage their personal information so that at least they don't have to rummage around in file cabinets to try to find the information that, that they need. Some of you might know that there's an innovation project coming out of the White House called myusa.gov that offers uh, a better approach to that, still without requiring much in the way of bureaucratic reform, but it's, a, it's an aid, kind of like these form-filling aids that are starting to show up in browsers, where if you're asked to fill in a certain form, the MyUSA system can actually pre-populate that form for you based on information that you've entered previously. So this is another area uh, which, which we think is, is ripe for uh, development. Another huge area that's also enabled by our computational infrastructure uh, these days, the networks that all of you are, are concerned about, is really in the, in the social space. And um, uh, I'll, I'll mention a couple of, um, uh, of, of different uh, concepts there. So one is assistance on demand, and this actually is starting to roll out as services in some places. So many people with disabilities are able to function effectively in the community most of the time 
but not all the time. They become disoriented or lost, and this can be pretty serious uh, when it happens. So the response to that today typically is that people don't go out on their own because of the risk that they might become disoriented or lost. What if there was a ready means for them to summon assistance when they need it so that they can now function more independently, being willing to take that risk? Yeah, I, I may get in trouble if I go and try to do that, but if I do, I have a way of summoning help from a trusted uh, network of potential uh, assistance. Another way in which social software uh, can benefit people with disabilities has to do with the sharing of knowledge and practices within the disability community. If you're a person with a disability, your needs are very individualized. And so for you to be able to share knowledge and best practices effectively, it's really important for you to find somebody whose situation is very similar in certain critical respects to yours. This is hard to do because, again, people are widely scattered. But we feel that advances in social software can provide better support for people identifying one another on the basis of common needs. Obvious challenges in all of these things, especially in the privacy space. That's one reason we're so happy to see that the NSTIC effort is taking interest in this, in this area. Uh, moving from the cloud, there are a bunch of other things in the technical space that I just wanted to uh, pack in here, and I know from talking with some of you that some of these things, as I say, they're not cloud-related, but they may be of interest to some of you out there, and I'd be delighted if you'd, uh, if you'd get in touch. So uh, many of you will know about Section 508 and the obligation of government agencies to make the information they put on the web accessible. A broad brush summary of where we are with that is uh, we're not where we want to be. Uh, the best managed agencies are able to do an okay kind of job, but really only with respect to textual content. So as we're getting a better handle on how to make textual information accessible, we're noticing that there's lots of other information that's becoming more and more important in the online space. One good example is maps. You know, technology has now made it so that over the last few years, it's now become really easy for people to use maps for all kinds of good purposes. And of course, uh, government agencies are participating in that as well we don't have a good solution for making map information accessible to people who can't see them. And this is a key area of research, uh, research challenges. Another one somewhat similar uh, comes up in the online education space that I mentioned to you uh, a couple of minutes ago. So some of you may have seen the announcement the other day that edX, which is the sort of MOOC consortium with MIT and Harvard, and I forget who else, so uh, edX announced that they are open sourcing their platform. The first installment of that open sourcing was specifically software for developing online interactive educational simulations. And they mentioned a couple of examples of things that they've developed. So there's a circuit simulator that's part of one of the MIT courses, and there's a molecule model simulator that's in one of the Harvard biology courses. Well, terrific. Now, suppose you're a blind student. What are you going to do with that online circuit simulation? We badly need work on how to take what we think of as intrinsic visual activities like that and how to deliver them in a form that offers access to the appropriate content to uh, people who can't see. Some of you may be thinking, well, that's utterly impossible to do. And it would be another talk, but I'll, I'll, just, I'll just give you a teaser and, and uh, uh, we can, uh, you know, to take it up if, if, you, if you're interested. Some of you might know T.V. Raman, who's an extremely capable blind computer scientist at Google. Uh, Raman and his colleague Charles Chan have a demonstration in which Raman, who's really completely blind, plays the online game Jawbreaker, which is something that involves clicking on clusters of colored disks and making them go away. And anybody, including yours truly, would look at that game and say, that's an intrinsically visual game. It's a contradiction in terms for a blind person to play it. It's not. And uh, Raman and Chen have actually developed not only the technology, but a conceptual framework for doing that. And that's a framework that's applicable to things like these circuit simulators. But we need to be uh, uh, doing it. Finally, particular interest of mine is access for people who face cognitive challenges. And this is another huge, uh, uh, huge area where research is needed. And I think our timing is such that
we'll, I'll close on this. I'd love to hear from any of you who are interested in these things. Also note that, uh, as I'm sure many of you are seeing, the nature of projects around the world is, is changing. So all of the projects that I've been talking with you here are really happening in public, and there's opportunity for anybody to participate. So again, those of you who are in touch with students and can direct them this way, it's a great way for people to be uh, involved, and also, of course, a, a great way for people to learn about what's going on in this, in this space. So thanks to all of you. And, uh, I forgot that we need to have a transition somewhere in here. I hope you, some of you at least have a few minutes for Q&A as we finish up here. So thanks, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. I would be remiss if, on behalf of the NIDRD program, I didn't also convey our gratitude to the Department of Energy's NIDRD program. Uh -huh. So I have, I have to be careful how I say that. <laughs> The other thing I would say is not just is GPII great work, I think that is really also very clearly the right thing to do. So on behalf of all of us, thank you, Dr. Lewis, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for those of you that are on the phone and those of you in the room, uh, as Dr. Lewis mentioned, this is, uh, this is the opportunity for follow-up. So uh, um, Dr. Bond, if you're out there, uh, is there a way for people on the phone to, uh, to um, Yes, sir. They just need to press star one. Very good. Oh, and Dr. Vaughn, press the star one. I'll open his line. And then we'll go to others, please. Bob, are you out there? Excuse me, Dr. Vaughn, your line is open. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay, yes, I'm here. Um, I just wanted to mention um, just briefly that uh, we're going to be holding a uh, clown accessibility workshop on June 12th down there. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, I'm uh, sorry. I don't know what's with the phone, so. No, that's quite all right. The, um, um, any questions, Bob? Any, anything that you'd like to uh, contribute to what you've seen and, uh, and heard this afternoon? Well, actually, so um, one, one of the things that uh, has an interest in uh, cloud accessibility are the uh, the types of uh, applications, et cetera, that the government is actually interested in uh, uh, procuring uh, under uh, cloud first policies. So for example, emails, uh, email um, SaaS packages or calendaring as well. So there are lots of vendors that are offering uh, these types of uh, services now. So I'd like to see uh, vendors somehow incorporate uh, accessibility into their into their um, into their offering. I think Clayton, you once made a comment that uh, it takes 42 clicks for some people to go from email to email. Yeah. So actually, uh, uh, I think the latest word is that this is that this is being fixed. But I'm not sure it's, it's actually completely out there, and I won't embarrass anybody by naming the the, uh, the webmail client. But there is a webmail client out there that uh, uh, passes technically what's called the keyboard accessibility requirement, which is that a person unable to use a mouse can actually operate whatever the piece of software is. That's what that's the force of keyboard accessibility. So this technically passes that because it is possible to read your email without using the mouse. However, when you start up the client, to get to your first message takes 42 keystrokes. And when you've read the, the first message and want to move on to the second one, it takes another 42 keystrokes to do that. So I think we, we can all agree that that means there's work to be done there. It also makes a point about the difference between sort of technically meeting a requirement, in this case, operability without a mouse, and effectively meeting the requirement in a way that actually does anybody any good. So, yeah, we're glad to be able to work with, with Bob and, and help uh, agencies as they move into the cloud understand the things they have to worry about there. Uh, I'll mention one other thing that um, because the nature of, of most cloud deployments is people are going to be using web clients. Uh, you really got to worry about what browser people are, are going to be using because uh, many uh, current accessibility features are only supported by uh, very recent uh, uh, browsers, and I, I know from my own personal experience, we don't get those browsers where I work. 
So people need to be aware of issues like that. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you, Bob. Um, uh, questions from in the room? Yeah. Dr. McDuffie? Yes, uh, very, very nice presentation. Uh, I, I was struck by the issue that you raised uh, with disabled people having to re-verify their status over and over again. Um, as electronic medical records become more prevalent, uh, won't that solve the problem, uh, assuming that the electronic medical records are accessible to the disabled? And once that's all electronic, you, you shouldn't have that issue. Well, that's going to be a big piece of it. And indeed, one of the things we need to do is, is to make sure we're working with the people who are working on EHR to, uh, to make all of this happen. So, yeah, there is a lot of overlap between the world of, of medical records, but it's not total. So there are other services that are not medical that people also need to, to deal with. So it's one of these cases where we need to really help people integrate their, their overall experience. And that's a theme of that My USA Innovation Project recognizing that we tend to look at service from an agency point of view in a way that's really all chopped up, you know, because we're in our agency and we offer what we offer. If you turn it around and you look at, at that world from the consumer's point of view, it looks crazy to them. You know, they're, they're seeing a world of services that they need and they're being asked to say, well, you know, you talk to these folks about that and these other folks about this other thing and so on. So, we really need to be integrating across the medical space and other forms of income assistance or other programs that, that uh, people are eligible uh, for. And being optimistic, it appears that the technology is emerging that should make that possible, but we, we need to take that opportunity and run with it. As a follow-up, are there any particular disabled groups that are larger in size or, or more um, in need of uh, assistance. So I'm thinking of hearing impaired, visually impaired, and then um, without limbs as being able to you know, in inhibit the human-machine interface. Yeah. So wh which of those groups is, is well, or is there a difference? Uh, it depends on who you count and how, uh, which, which makes it a contentious kind of issue, but without getting trying to get into the middle of that, I'll make two points. Uh, so one is, uh, actually Jim, Tobias, uh, and I have done a couple of focus groups with people in higher education. So you notice that one of the things in the video there is uh, campuses have an obligation to provide accommodations for students with disabilities. But when you talk, as we did to the folks providing those accommodations, they'll admit that their best efforts are not up to actually uh, doing it. But at any rate, what brought that to mind is that uh, the, the biggest part of their caseload on campuses are actually people with cognitive challenges and learning disabilities. So that's the biggest group that they, they deal with. And the kind of accommodations they need are some of the things I was showing there. So outline views, uh, text-to-speech is actually very big. So some people talk about the category of text disability. You can have trouble with text because you can't see it. But, but if you could hear it, you can understand it perfectly well. Or you can have trouble, you can see it, but you can't actually decode it. And again, for some such people, hearing it is, you know, what will get the job done. So the cognitive segment is, is, is really big. But the other point I wanted to make, it kind of illustrated by that last point is, one of the fortunate things about the technology is that it's kind of agnostically beneficial across a wide range of things. So, some of the same things that help people with certain cognitive limitations are also helpful for people with certain visual challenges, which is, which is nice. So it means you'd, you're not having to always make a choice. You know, are you supporting this group rather than that group? You can really bundle things together. And that's, that's part of the vision behind the, the, uh, the GPI is to have this be something inclusive that's maximally flexible and will support the widest range of people without uh, actually, I'll throw in one more point there, and this is a point that Yuta Trevoranis uh, makes. So investigations have shown that, that some organizations spend more time qualifying people to research, they spend more money qualifying people to receive services than they do delivering the services. Okay? So the idea of the GPI, and it was said but kind of in passing in the video, but it's a powerful point. It just works. You don't have to explain or justify anything. Okay, so today people with disabilities are asked over and over again to prove that they're entitled to whatever it, it might be, to an accommodation. 
we believe the technology is now able to make these services sufficiently cheap that nobody needs to meter them, so to speak. But instead, we can just put them out there. And another aspect of that, sorry to be running on here, but you've got me started. Another thing is there are lots of people who need what we're talking about here, but who would never think of themselves as a person with a disability. Okay, so our notion is, look, this is something, everybody's going to need this stuff. You know, sooner or later, we're all going to, we're all going to need it if we don't need it now. So let's put it on a footing where it's available to everybody. And again, we know the logic of economics of technology is, you know, the more people you serve, the less it costs to serve them. So let's, let's go with that. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you, um, Ernest. Um, let's go back to the phone. Uh, questions from our audience? Yes, sir, and I will remind parties to press star 1 to ask a question, but you do have a few questions in queue. Greg Vander Heiden, your line is open. Hi. Uh, a couple of things. Uh, <clears throat> Clayton, you made a really excellent point about, you know, making things uh, cheap enough they don't need to be metered. Another way that GPII can help is that there are things that you have to purchase, and so you want to be able to make sure that only people who qualify can use them, or who paid for them, if you would. Uh, but we have situations where we have children who are part of a school system that buys uh, software they need to use in order to, to, to work, but they can't do any homework or go to the library and do any work, because as soon as they leave the school, the software is no longer available to them, and the company would make that software work for the child, except that the schools can't tell the software company who the kids are. And so with the GPII, um, they can actually give tokens so that wherever the kid goes, the software can follow them without uh, anybody knowing the, who that is. The other thing I wanted to, to just toss out here is for the NSF people, uh, is a potential grand challenge. Um, if we could create, and this would take a very large amount of money, but it would advance uh, machine vision and, and all sorts of other things as well. Um, but if we could make it so that you could have what I would call a, an infobot that would be able to look at a page and be able to draw all of the semantics off of it, it could then be represented to people with the different types of disabilities without requiring website authors to keep doing extra things for each of their websites. If you could make a website or an infobot that could and understand a page that was that 50% of the population could understand, so it's not a really terribly complicated one, but one that 50% could understand, you could then make it so that it could represent information in the forms needed by, by others. So um, anyone who's interested in looking at grand challenges that would both significantly advance this area and advance all sorts of other areas of science at the same time, uh, this would be an, an interesting one to think about um, going forward. Thank you. Greg, let me just uh, piggyback on the first of those, those points to, to remind people that uh, one of the themes in GPII is supporting commercial uh, 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 development. And, and adding to your illustration about the, the, uh, the, the K-12 student, one of the things that Jim and I learned in our higher ed focus groups is it's very, very painful for people providing accommodations for students on campus to see that they can't do that in a way that students can take it with them when they leave. So one of the things that GPII is going to do is make it possible for someone to subscribe to the services that they need while they're on campus. Perhaps the bill for that subscription is paid by the institution, but when they graduate, they don't have to give it up. If, if they can secure support from their own resources or other resources to keep that subscription going, it's a seamless transition for them. They can now go off into the workplace and take that same technology with them, which really is hardly possible uh, today. So that, but that support for commercial development is extremely important here. Uh, that's that's the only way in, in our economy that, that many of the resources we're talking about here are going to be are going to be available. Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Thank you, Greg. Uh, other questions of, from the phone? Yes, sir. Next question comes from Tim Cragen. Your line is open. 
Um, hi, uh, Dr. Lewis. Uh, thank you very much for this presentation. This is fascinating. I have two, two questions. The first one is, will this presentation be archived anywhere or available so people can you know, download and look at it? Um, yes, the, uh, the presentation will be, uh, will be available through the um, uh, NIDR.gov uh, faster web presence. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And then the second question I had was, um, in uh, the opportunity slide towards the end of the presentation, you talked about the need to have cognitive accessibility of information and services. And as you're aware, and uh, Greg Vanderheiden, who's on the phone and also is aware, this is an issue that in the 508 refresh, for example, we have worked with and we have tried to get, you know, data and information on this. Um, are there any new resources or new, new areas we could look at for uh, information or guidance on this, such as any sort of, you know, suggestions or guidance in this area? Well, uh, thanks, Tim. Uh, sadly, this continues to be an area of, of under-investment. In um, uh, so there's not as much new as, as I would like. Uh, I always uh, point people to Cindy Rowland and her group at Utah State, but I'm sure you're, I know she was involved certainly in the refresh effort, and, but, but you, could, you could check back uh, with her. Mm -hmm. We're hoping at NIDR to, to get a uh, small exploration ourselves going on this in, in cooperation with uh, folks in Social Security. So they, they have a situation where much of their information uh, they know that a large part of the audience uh, for this information is people who are facing cognitive challenges. As, as, as people age, virtually everybody faces some level of, of, of cognitive uh, uh, challenge. So there's a, there's a crying need to, to really do more looking in, in this area, to develop more ex examples. The, the, the techniques are there, some of them. Uh, so I'll mention one that, that surfaced in our conversation with, uh, with Social Security. It's a little bit unexpected. So, again, one of the developments that we're increasingly taking for granted in the online world is personalization. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you identify yourself, so you're not just looking at, at a site uh, as an anonymous member of the public, but you're looking at, uh, you know, my Social Security. Indeed, Social Security is moving towards that. Well, this has potentially enormous benefits. Uh, for people with uh, cognitive limitations because it means that the information you're presented can be much more effectively filtered. If you go today and you look at a site describing a bunch of services, it doesn't know who you are, and so it has to describe every service that conceivably could be relevant to you, which most of them are not going to be relevant to you. If they know who you are, then they can just present to you the programs that are relevant to you, which is enormous gain for somebody who has a challenge understanding complex uh, information. So that's, that's, just, that's just one, one example. Uh, so we are gradually getting more ideas about what to do, but work to, to, to really put these things into practice and study their impact is uh, very, very badly needed. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Lewis. Let's go back to the phone for one more question, and then we'll come back to the room. Next question, please. At this time, sorry, show no further questions in queue. Oh, very good. Well, thank you. Uh, from our audience here in the room. Oh. Very good. Uh, Dr. Lewis, again, on behalf of the NIDA program, it's been a privilege to, uh, to host you this afternoon. Well, thank you so much for doing that, and thanks to everybody in the audience, and I hope that uh, 